I'd like to thank everybody for being here, wherever here is, and to say we'll begin at the beginning. Imagine a pyramid standing alone by the sea, each side a hundred miles long. It's a mountain, nearly four miles high. In its folds, imagine every different climate on Earth. This is the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. The people hidden here call the Sierra the heart of the world, and themselves the elder brothers. That was how the Kogi people of Colombia were first introduced to the world. The mountain is on Colombia's Caribbean coast. The Spanish had encountered a highly developed civilization here with large cities. They called its people Tyrona. In 1599, they set about destroying them. But the invaders never managed to conquer or settle here. In 1990, these, which are lower slopes, were controlled by drug lords and guerrilla armies. What happened higher up was little known. Here is where the Tyrona survivors retreated, hidden, to continue their civilization. Some are the Kogi. The mountain is a tiny tectonic plate, squeezed between the Caribbean and South American plates. One corner has been tilted upwards and rises directly from 600 meters below the tropical sea to glaciers. It's driven by some three dozen steep river valleys. Now it's the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, the most irreplaceable protected area in the world for threatened species. The east side of this mountain faces desert, the west jungle, and the Kogi understand it not as a geographical feature, but as a living being. They regard their home as a single ecological being, a thinking, feeling, biological entity containing the internal and surface organs that sustain it. Many of its rivers descend from glacial lakes to tropical mangrove lagoons, and their flow is regarded as serving the functions of blood, urine, bile, and other liquids within the body. Its forests and plants are necessary covering for its skin surface and are sometimes referred to as hair. Each individual part of the structure has its own life. Cutting down a tree is really equated with taking a human life, but that's within the larger context of the living mountain. The Tyrona lived at every level of the mountain, symbiotic partners of what the Kogi describe as its biological processes, exchanging materials, seafood, resources, crops and fruits from the different vertically structured ecological zones using well-crafted stone paths and stairways. The river valleys gave structure to this pattern and were inevitably linked to lineages. At the lower level, Tyrona lived in large settlements and farmed extensively. They were governed by warrior chiefs, caciques, supported by spiritual leaders who the Spanish called Naomas. These communities were driven to rebellion after decades of colonial demands for gold and pearls, and then they were ruthlessly attacked and destroyed. 
their social structures were annihilated, and they were driven in scattered groups into less accessible and less fertile mountain regions where they constructed new, smaller settlements. But they were not colonized, and they retained their languages. The Kogi believe that they were created in order to feed and sustain the mountain and care for it. So they had to find a way to continue their work and protect their knowledge. They avoided contact. Very few understood Spanish. There was no Christianity, no roads, no wheels, no outside technology or costume when I got there. Here is, I think, the best preserved of all pre-Columbian cultures, not just in material terms, but in the way they think. The Tyrona didn't have a written language, nor did the Kogi. Their knowledge is passed down to men and women called suns and moons, mamas and sachas. This requires extraordinary training. The majority of those selected are taken from birth into a cave or double-walled house and raised in the dark for up to 18 years. Much of their education is at night. They have a special diet and an extraordinary amount to learn. History, cosmology, and what we would call mythology, textiles and agriculture, medicine and social management, theatrical and musical performance. And most crucially, they must learn the precise working of the physical world and the detailed functions and narratives of some 700 special sites and the ways in which they must listen and act. They are part of the Massif, but unlike the rest of nature, they are in active, conscious and responsible communication with it. This is not the simple belief in nature as an amorphous divinity, like the Bolivian Pachamama. This is analytic, in a sense, medical knowledge of what we think of as a mountain. They speak of it as Gonawindua. It begins with go, anticipation. Continues na, the pre-dawn light, which we call astronomical dawn, and then win the first movement of life in the womb, and ends in dua. Dua meaning the burst of ejaculation across the heavens, which we call the Milky Way, and also meaning every tiny form of life on earth and in the sea, and a generic term for all shells. Gono in dua is not a thing, not an object, it is a process. It is the quickening of the world. It is the process of fertility. A men's meeting house is called a nuhue, a world house, built with the architecture of the cosmos. It is invisibly mirrored below the floor. The rings around the roof are the nine worlds, the nine months of gestation, all attached to the central cross on which the world stands. It is also, of course, Gono Indua. They are inside Gono Indua, which contains life, landscape and law. It connects rivers, sea and sky on a systematic basis. The idea of original law, se, is fundamental to Kogi science and society. They understand all nature to be subject to se, and it is the job of humans to repair damage done by human action. That work begins here in the world house, the Nuhue. Gathered here, they're directly engaged in a living process which requires them to work with the totality and interconnectedness of the world. So, every intervention involves knowing the detailed movement of air and water through soil, rivers, clouds, understanding the needs of all the myriad plants and creatures, and their exchanges with each other, with the land, with the water, and of course, these people's own communities. In the 1980s, they saw profound changes in the health of the living world. Rainfall, clouds, birds, insects, temperature, sounds and smells, the behavior of the water, indicating that we, who they call the younger brothers, are at the point of destroying it. They decided that they needed to warn us about this, and that decision resulted in my helping them make that documentary from the heart of the world, The Elder Brothers Warning, from which you saw the beginning. It was broadcast in time for the Earth Summit in Rio. It had some impact, but of course, little, if anything, actually changed. Their communication was generally seen as being ethical rather than practical, insisting on the obligation of humans to care for the world as a living and feeling being.
thing, and esoteric, suggesting that they have a mystical or spiritual connection with the natural world that may be valuable, but has no testable validity. Humans need water. They have to have water to live. The earth is the same. It was made perfect by Saranqua, but now it is weak and diseased. The animals die, the trees dry up, people become ill. Many new illnesses will appear. There will be no cure or medicine for them. And the reason is that younger brother is violating fundamental principles continually, totally, drilling, mining, extracting petrol, minerals, stripping away the world. So although the Coggy's presentation had a powerful emotional appeal, and many people felt strongly that they needed to take it seriously, it had little to add to scientific and pragmatic understanding of environmental issues, or to distinguish it from the general perspective presented by indigenous people globally. Their message's weight lay in the Coggy's presentation of themselves. They thought that we didn't know how much damage we cause, and their warning would inform us and change things. They established their own exotic authority, but added little to, of practical value to the green argument that built strength over the following years. They never addressed the question of whether they have any concrete understanding of ecological systems that's different from and perhaps supplementary to our own. The Coggy have now realized that we don't know that the Earth is alive. They say their understanding is based on testable foundations, which are more truthful than our own fractured vision. They decided to try again. They want to speak from what we see as a more scientific basis and engage in conversation with younger brother scientists. They set out to explain how they believe their own environment needs to be managed. So in 2009, the collective leadership of the Kogi Mamas brought me back to try again and set out to explain with a further educational documentary, which I helped them make over the next three years. The meeting we begin with illustrates the gulf they have to bridge. This is up at around 3,000 meters at a nodal point on the neural network of Gonovindua. It's called an Eswama. The gathering is of mamas and sagas and the mountain, which had apparently... <laughs> The additional voices you hear are the sagas. They're speaking the same words as him. Seated on the ground, they speak with words coming from the earth, which are then declared by the mama. This is Gano Indua calling. We haven't spoken clearly enough to the younger brother. The situation doesn't only affect us, but everyone in the world, even the English on the far side of the sea. What is happening is a massacre of the sites. Those sites are understood as living places in Gonavindua that provide essential sustenance to and communicate with others to which they are linked by threads. The fabric of the world is a dense weave of threads, its nerves, veins, arteries. Some are physically manifest in surface water flows. Some are underground flows and the paths of winds and clouds. Some are revealed in the movements of animals and birds. This drawing's authenticated by the mamas. It was done for them. Some are trains of thought, connections only graspable by people specially trained from birth, raised for 18 years in the dark. Is this graspable? They navigate through the world using a completely different set of coordinates from us and hearing it speak to them. The Kogi understand the cosmos to be rooted in a single consciousness which underpins space and time. This is Aluna, and all physical reality is, in their view, the manifestation of ideas conceived in Aluna. So the job of the Mama is to strive to comprehend by concentration and observation, his place in the laws that shape the ideas manifested in reality. He participates in the laws of nature. In 2018, two mamas and a saga came to the Drôme in France with a French NGO called Chenduqua to compare their way of knowing a landscape with ours. 
Coggy do not make visual images of any kind, but they were invited to show how the ideas within might be represented in visible form. They supervised younger brothers to represent the invisible thought of the dynamic flow of water, air, and influence in the obscurity of a lunar, which the Kogi perceived beneath the Dholm's illuminated skin. Particular sites, represented symbolically by appropriate shells, were identified as having a function and a mission, each linked to a type of ecosystem or species of animals or plants. They speak of the whole world structured in this way. Then their Kogi translator took a brush for the first time in his life and helped with painting what they saw as the visible illuminated trace of the ideas that shaped this landscape. Younger brother sees things differently. The foot of the Sierra, where the mountain rivers meet the warm Caribbean, was shrouded in dense mangrove swamps. To open the land for development, Colombia built a coastal highway, slicing through the threads, tearing the fabric that they couldn't see. One of the world's largest mangrove forests became an immense graveyard of wooden stumps. The Kogi want us to understand that their work is based on deeper insight. The evidence supports them. Ancestrally, they were remarkably successful at land management. The population of the Sierra when the Spanish first arrived has recently been estimated at around 700,000. The river valleys were still well wooded in 1970. This was the Rio Ancho Valley. The green represents forest cover. 25 years later, it had been almost completely deforested. Today, the Sierra supports less than a tenth of the population before the conquest, and requires a UN food assistance program. The systems in use for land management before the conquest were evidently much more effective than those available now. The indigenous are adamant that the only way to avoid the total failure of the life in and of the Sierra is to stop the invasion and destruction of the vital sites that connect the threads. Younger brother needs to stay away, the four indigenous people of Gono Indua, Kogi, Wiwa, Kwanguamo, and Arwako fought a long campaign for this, walking and mapping what they call their Black Line Frontier. Gonovindua is part of the living world, and drawing a frontier doesn't change that, but there are lines which should not be crossed. They demand exclusive control of the ancestral land within the Black Line, and need to show that they know how to look after it better than younger brother. It would help to have the support of recognized scientific authorities. Since the Kogi believe in building on firm foundations, they began with revealing their knowledge of the underpinnings of the world. Which was why Mama Shibalata came to Mill Hill Observatory in London. We arranged a meeting with a world-renowned astronomer to see if the Kogi picture of the universe can make sense as science. I'd like to begin by asking the Kogi view of the world, how large it is and its form. Say, absolute darkness, blackness, is the condition of the uncreated cosmos, when it was only thought in the consciousness of the mother. The act of creation was a separation or withdrawal of the darkness. As one informant explained to me, there was a flat cloth. The cloth is uncreated, black. Then a corner of the cloth was lifted, separating the cloth below from the cloth above. And in the newly opened space between was material reality, the present. This space is not filled with the mother's thought, but reveals a trace of it. The world is illuminated. The separation of below from above was the separation of the future from the past. 
But if all you know of the world is what is revealed to your senses, that would hardly compare with using scientific instruments like the Hubble telescope, would it? What we see through the telescope, so this is a picture of a small part of the sky, and what we see is lots of systems of stars that we couldn't see without the telescope. And then this hand, and get do so away now. Mm hmm. That's a star. Yeah. That's that's one. That is one star by itself. And he, Mama says Mama has found the one star in this a single isolated star in this picture straight away. In a tossing. That's right. Mm -hmm. But we cannot see it. Why couldn't we learn from them? Mama Shivalasa knows more than he sees with his eyes. These maps are generally small, unobtrusive lines on rocks and boulders. This extraordinarily large one was at the entrance to a Tyrona town, which you saw from a helicopter shot earlier. It's known as Ciudad Perdida, the lost city. The Aswamas are points of connection with the darkness and with what we might call the nervous system of the living mountain. This is an Aswama bearing a map. An Aswama is a location with what the Kogi call authority. The same word means human political authority, but the authority here is Aluna. It's also a place where humans and the world connect. Humans, in the Kogi perspective, are embedded in nature, and here they listen to it and are instructed by it. It's on a thread, an invisible line of uncreated thought that links it to a place on the coast. It can be understood as a fissure in the solid structure revealed to us, a fracture in the reality that stands between memory and possibility, past and future. The place where the thread meets the sea is described as a sacred place, an awkward word, but in this case it means dangerous and untouchable. Information flows between these places, and that's crucial to the mama's work. There are many radial black lines connecting with the coast illustrated on this very incomplete map. Information flows through the water. The Kogi work constantly at the sights on them. They understand all life in terms of balance between masculine and feminine. The dynamic creative energy of the material world is spoken of as Father Sarankwa. The considered thought that is its essence is Mother Aluna. All features of the world are gendered, and imbalance, especially the imbalance of masculine interference with the mother, has immediate physical consequences which must be healed. The ancient Chinese theory of acupuncture has a similar philosophy, yin and yang, and claims that energy flows between them in the body along invisible channels. A small intervention in its flow by the insertion of a fine needle can correct an imbalance at its destination. Precise interventions made at Iswamas could be appropriately described as earth acupuncture, especially as they regard the land itself as a living body. At this Iswama, mamas do their work on ancient stone seats by the river. Mama Shibulata explained, Iswamas connect with the shore. They connect with the sea and they have authority over everything. It's a hot spot, a meeting point. Its power reaches over the sea and the mountains. It has always been this way. We visit Eswamas to make offerings to the mother in the mountains and along the coast. Those offerings represented by fragments of leaf, of cotton, of shell, held between thumb and forefinger, are the focus of a tremendous concentration. The Aswama is a human element. Each Aswama is the responsibility of a particular lineage, 
and where the Kogi have territorial security, a resident mama devotes his life to its care. This is the mama of a site called Sejwa. He is a permanent part of the Eswama, and he can never leave. Eswamas are described as stores of knowledge, and there and in other places on the threads, ancestral knowledge is encoded in marvelous Tyrona pieces made from Tumbaga, a gold copper alloy using a lost technology. The surface is depletion gilded. Of course, most have been stolen. They are the texts of transcendent laws of nature, and offerings are made at them. They are described as the mothers and fathers of life. Kogi say particular sites are core refuges for species necessary for survival. That opinion is shared by Jonathan Bailey, Director of Conservation Programs at the Zoological Society of London. This gold macaw the size of my hand was found at a site the mummers said was such a place for macaws. They blamed the disappearance of the birds on the plunder of this kind of spiritual parent. Dr. Bailey said he wants to work with them. There are 348 sacred sites named on the black line, each with a particular role and linked to a different Iswama higher up. The mummers know them all, and this is the basis of their work. For the new film, they decided it was time to explain. Part of that would involve connecting the sites on the black line with hundreds of kilometers of gold thread. They planned the journey in the sand. <laughs> And that's what For the film, their specific illustration of the connection was in Eswama where the environment shows signs of serious damage attributable, in their view, to damage done at the connected site below. The lower site had been used to construct a coastal power station, Tiama Guajira, commissioned in the 1980s. The operation of the plant had resulted in the drying out of the mangrove swamp around it. This is the estuary of the Rio Ancho, which comes down from the Sierra. It's dead. The Kogi call this site Jaze Shikaka and say it once had about 30 channels, corresponding to all the river valleys of the Sierra and connected to them. These were a place of offerings connected to the entire massif. They have been eliminated. The power station has drained the Rio Ancho. Up here at about 2000 meters, they took me to the associated Iswama next to the river. Their purpose was to show how damage below had caused damage above and with the connecting thread broken. It's irreparable. The effect of the power station has been to accelerate the river flow, causing torrents and landslides and draining the source lakes of the river in the high tundra at about four and a half thousand meters. Once they were drained, the river shrank and significant changes are now occurring to the vegetation around it, including the death of a huge ancient coca bush, which they regard as central to their culture. They complained that wrecking the estuary had devastated the river all the way up. But Professor Herman Galvis, an expert on rivers from the National University of Colombia, told them that was quite impossible. No hay ninguna circunstancia que traslade ese efecto hacia arriba. El efecto hacia abajo es lógico, lo traslada el agua. Entonces, muchas cosas, la erosión, la deforestación, las partes altas, tienen efecto sobre las partes bajas, pero lo contrario no es muy evidente. Es más, no es evidente desde un punto de vista.
あったかあ食いひんなんか生きるか食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いや食いやこの先、あれんがみがいもいれやはばむぐちゃんちゅうぜかいん。うん、ごめん、これ、のえっりこ、えんけふるまふる。え、la conexión de las lagunas de arriba a las de abajo es obvia. El agua corre hacia abajo. Y el agua lleva cosas. Pero, ¿qué lleva las cosas de vuelta de las lagunas de abajo a las de arriba? Bueno, hoy, en que ふんかばん、hoy. はい。At this particular example, it's a common place that rivers depend on a water cycle involving evaporation, clouds, and precipitation. Less common place is the Kogi's contention that this water cycle is tied to specific localities. That's why the drying up of a river's source is explained by the disappearance of a specific body of water at the river's mouth. This reflects the most modern work on creating a synthesized holistic understanding in which rivers are analyzed as parts of a bigger system. Understanding river ionic ecosystems has had direct practical results, such as removing canalization from estuaries to revive river headwaters. The indigenous were demanding that the state should recognize the black line as the base of a suffering living being. It should stop people injuring Gonavindua. Which should be recognized in law as a person. Companies and government agencies have rights as juridical persons, and now so do some living ecologies. These ecological persons cannot be owned. Their indigenous inhabitants are the guardians who speak for them. This legal concept was developed by Christopher D. Stone, who published Should Trees Have Standing Towards Legal Rights for Natural Objects in 1972. It turned out to have legs. In 2014, New Zealand declared that the home of the Tuhoi people, Te Orai Waira, is an environmental legal entity, no longer a state owned national park, but owned by itself. And then in 2017, declared the Wanganui River to be part of another legal person named Te Oachipua. And recognized as an indivisible and living whole from the mountain to the sea. In 2016, following the New Zealand example, the Colombian Supreme Court granted environmental personhood to the Atrato River Basin, 500 kilometers southwest of Gonoindua, with its rights exercised by its guardians, the indigenous people, and the state. In the final act of President Santos before leaving office in 2018 was to issue a decree protecting the ancestral territory demarcated by the Black Line. It says, Gonoindua's threads are like veins in the body, forming a sacred fabric interrelating territory, culture, and nature, the basis of life, and that the black line connects the material world with spiritual principles of the origin of life, which is wonderful, but it carefully avoids recognizing Gonoindua as having rights as a living being. And now there's a new government, and the decree is challenged. Hundreds of mining permits have been issued, hotels are being built, armed groups have used the pandemic as an opportunity to seize Kogi land. Illegal gold mining is an even bigger business in Colombia than cocaine. 
The Coggy are quite certain that the black line should be a red line for humanity, a line we do not cross, to sustain the living mountain and us. Humans need water. The Coggy warned back in 1990, we have to have water to live. The Sierra only receives one third of the rain of 40 years ago. The glaciers have melted. Drought desiccates the rainforest. The half million inhabitants of Santa Marta now have to buy their water from trucks. The combination of global warming and massive wastage is making the region increasingly uninhabitable. The Coggy sees settlers clearing land for holiday homes and felling special trees like this fallen giant, which sustains the springs in the forest. They're anxious to demonstrate the validity of their knowledge and are right now, today, meeting to establish a transcultural restoration project. They will work with academic younger brother experts to record how their way of working can produce results that we need to comprehend, bringing water back to dry land and reviving lost springs. Their work restoring degraded forests, rivers and habitats in the foothills achieves what ours cannot. One particular example is in the Waichaka River Valley, which was devastated by lowland deforestation and inefficient farming, and then purchased by the indigenous people. The river had almost dried up, the animals had disappeared. Over 20 years, working at Iswamas and sacred sites, they restored the forest, increased the river to a healthy volume, and saw the return of animal life. The Mummers are right now meeting to establish a transcultural restoration project to work with academic younger brother experts to record how their way of working can produce results that we need to comprehend. The project has been adopted by a new UNESCO initiative called Bridges. Under the auspices of its intergovernmental program for the management of social transformations most, it brings together national authorities, scientific communities and civil society to strengthen the connection between research and policy and between knowledge and action. It is to be a pilot demonstration of how indigenous and formal knowledge systems can work together to salvage a measure of sustainability at this time of climate crisis. It means what they take to be the Coggy's voice is being heard at an international institutional and academic level. But when a mama speaks on this platform, the words are not his own. This is the Living Mountain Gono Indua calling. We haven't spoken clearly enough to the younger brother. The situation doesn't only affect us, but everyone in the world, even the English on the far side of the sea. What is happening? is a massacre of the sites. So. so thank you very much. I've come to the end. If you want to know more, do have a look at Tyrona Trust um, and where you'll find quite a bit more. And there's an enormous amount of information, of course. Thank you for listening. Thank you for staying. I can stop there. Alan, that's absolutely just extraordinary. It moves me every time you speak about this, every time you talk about it. Um, I feel incredibly moved and I have to pull myself together to be able to actually <laughs> engage and ask questions that are sensible because it's very powerful, very impactful, very inspirational. I suppose it's very heartening also that the Kogi keep on. They are not giving up. They're trying to meet halfway, if not even more, uh, authorities. And I wanted to ask you, you said that they're meeting today or it's happening today. Did you actually mean today? Or I did mean today. Yeah. So I mean, what's, what's been happening is that following the pandemic, and the death of the guy that ran their organization that dealt with the outside world, mm -hmm. their whole um, political organization structure collapsed mm -hmm. and it's now being put back together again. And as a part of that process, the mamas have to meet in hidden places, high in the mountains, quite large gatherings, in order to discuss how to move forward, how to restructure their own administration and how to continue their dealings with us. And that actually means reevaluating the Bridges project because um, there's been a lost continuity here. Bridges is ready to go forward and is waiting to do it. 
the Kogi are not quite so convinced that we have our hearts in this business and they want to be reassured about that. Do you think the pandemic has changed that for on our side, not on their side? I mean, do you think that there's movement forward on that? Um, actually, I think there is. But from the Kogi perspective, um, as things change and then, then they put propositions to us and we say, um, we don't fully understand this. We're not quite comfortable with that bit. Then, oh, right. You're not so interested. Oh, yes. Stop. <laughs> it's very difficult to move forward carefully with them in a way that they feel comfortable with and understand. But this is, of course, fundamental. This what they're doing, mm. uh, getting us to change direction, mm. basically fundamental to the survival of Gonavindua, as we and us. It's the same thing. Mm. Yes. If Gonavindua dies, it means the world's died. Yes. 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 A lot more in this. I'm just having a look to see if um, there's any questions here. Lots of comments, um, really, uh, people being... Jessica says she has a question for Alan. Right, thanks. Okay, Jessica. Okay, so, uh, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and I was just wondering, what is your perspective on the application of the ideas presented by the Kogi to, you know, you talk a lot about the, you know, the earth as a whole, but then what about outside of that? Cause like I do a lot of things in the context of the space sector, things like that. And so kind of the predominant narrative and, oh, we're gonna go explore the moon, you know, okay, we need to quick, you know, you start utilizing resources and create this space economy. And to me, I kind of see it as this exportation of a system that hasn't worked very well on earth to outside of earth. Um, but a lot of people will say, oh, we're going to take a better care of Earth because we'll take all the polluting stuff off world and, you know, the Earth will be this wonderful place we'll take care of and we'll just, you know, do our wasteful stuff outside of that. So I'm just wondering, um, do you have any insight on, you know, the application of those ideas outside of the physical body of the Earth itself? Do I have? In your uh, context with the Kogi or anything else? Do you mean do the Kogi have or do I have? I guess either way, I, I, mean, I meant specifically with your interaction with the Kogi and what they've relayed. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I try to be a voice for them rather than to um, put forward my own ideas because personally my own ideas are quite different from theirs. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the Kogi view of all our interference with nature is that we are um, idiotically confident in the truth that we know today which is different from the truth that we knew last week and different from the truth that we'll know next week. And that's what makes us so dangerous. Um, so, the, you know, the, the, their world, their, their, their understanding of us as they watch us act is that we are full of all sorts of bright ideas which are, are not understood properly by us, which have consequences that we don't comprehend at all. I mean, the destruction of the mangrove swamp was a perfect example. You know, this was supposed to improve things. And we went in and destroyed things. And we'll do the same again and again and again. Uh, you've probably come across the proposition that the way to end global warming is to replicate enormous um, uh, volcanic explosions, which created perpetual winter for a few years in the 19th century. So to um, launch dust into the upper atmosphere, that would mean that the sky was perpetually white and we were no longer heated by the sun to the same extent. That's the kind of clever ideas we have about working in space. The Kogi are not impressed. Mm. Yes. Yes, indeed. And um, so, Alan, it was interesting. I picked up that you said you feel that you are the voice for the Kogi. Do, do, you, do you sense that everything now that you're doing is shaped by that path? Uh, well, I try to... Um... I mean, I'm, I'm hopelessly inadequate, but I try to reflect what they want. Um, I've learned a lot from them. Mm. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that I understand better philosophically from long conversations with them. They are, um, uh, because they don't have writing, they have much more intellectual power than I do. I mean, the amount of education that you get in 18 years in a hut in the Sierra somewhat exceeds what you get in 18 months in Cambridge, which is what a degree gives you. Um, and uh, they, they, they know a lot more than I do. And I, I, it takes me usually several months to understand why they would have said what they've said to me after I've left. Yeah. And why I have to keep going back. Um, also, I personally, like many people who are involved with indigenous people, I think it's all too late. 
but they don't. Mm. Mm. Yes, and therein lies a, um, a conundrum, isn't it? It's um, if we feel it's too late, but they don't. How do you work that? How do you, oh, you just put aside what you feel? Yeah. How dare you <laughs> impose your <laughs> pessimism yeah. on their optimism? Yeah. Not entitled to it. You have some knowledge? No, you have this Western fantasy that you know things because you've got a degree or whatever. It's just ridiculous. Yes. Other questions for Alan? I have an answer to a question that nobody's asked yet. Oh, good, yes. £80,000 a year. Right, OK. Uh, you need for the trust to help... Uh, for the project, that's right, yes. OK, OK. Uh, somebody should have asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> and we can donate on the uh, website. So you, oh, you can donate on the website, exactly, yes. Yes, yes. we take inheritances. Yeah, okay. <laughs> After all, if it fails, what was the point of the inheritance? Um, Natushka is saying how wonderful to hear they don't think it's too late. Um, and she says, how many other such native cultures exist with such beliefs? It's a good question. Do you know? Um, you might not because you're focused on the Kogi, but... Uh... No, look, there, there are a lot of indigenous cultures who listen to the Kogi and take them seriously and reflect what they say. And the Kogi are actually the guardians of knowledge of a number of other American cultures. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, 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 I went, traveled to the Kogi with the guy who described himself as the senior Mayan day keeper of Guatemala. He had been educated as a child by the Kogi mamas. And the Maya of Guatemala, he told me, every 12 years, send a child to be educated by the Kogi. Also, the Kogi, um, with the Muiscas are rediscovering their inheritance of knowledge, being taught it by Kogi mamas, who took Muisca knowledge into their territory for protection when the Muisca were destroyed. There is a, a lot of communication between indigenous people. Um, most of which we don't know anything much about, and it's not our business. Mm. Hmm. Yes, yes. Um, Larry said, how did you gain their trust to share their knowledge with you and society? Uh, when I first went, I was trying to make a film about the Lost City. Um, uh, but when I, as I grasped some understanding of what was going on what their concerns were i simply turned up and sent messages i didn't turn up i sent messages i was very careful not to confront them i sent messages saying if you want to speak to the world i can help you and it turned out that although quite a lot of filmmakers had been in touch saying i want to make a film about you nobody had made that offer and that was the one they'd been waiting for mm. 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 yes and the other thing is, I'm not an anthropologist, and I know nothing. <laughs> I went in with no knowledge of any kind. And after they said yes, I said, right, now we have to wait a year, because I don't know what questions to ask, and I have to learn everything. Mm -hmm. That probably helped a bit. Mm. Yes. Yes. And I was just working it out, and it's about 32 years since that encounter, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, so I'm now um, um, a piece of furniture in the Sierra. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, people tell me that their grandfather told me, <laughs> told them about me. <laughs> uh, Anna said, does the training in the dark relate to cosmology in any way, or is it simply not to be disturbed by everyday life? Everything is everything else. Um, so you can't draw distinctions and say, oh, no, that's, that, that's this, that's not that. Everything is everything else. The, 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 there are two nine-year nine periods, which are the nine months of the womb being reenacted over nine years. Um, the darkness is the womb, uh, is before creation. Um, uh, cosmology, 
what isn't cosmology? I, that's difficult. Mm. Mm. Yes. Uh, and Larry said, in their society, do the men speak with authority or the women or both? Um, the men speak with authority to outsiders and the women speak with authority to men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, basically, there is no such thing as a functioning mama without a saga taking care of him. Mm kitting him out for the day, checking that he knows what he's supposed to be doing, checking that he has all the materials required to perform his various tasks, and then, well, not pushing him out the door because he has a separate house of his own. Men and women don't sleep in the same houses. Even family units? That is a family unit. It's two oh. houses. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. It's just a real uh, separa separation of, of gender is fundamental in that world. Mm. Hmm. Uh, and Janetta said, would the Coggy be willing to teach Westerners? Yes. Yes. Mm. The question is how to do it. But the whole point of this project is it's a teaching project. Mm. Mm. The, the idea is that we get to understand what it is they do in a way that is useful, partly because it's only by that teaching that they'll establish the authority to lay claim to the territory. Yes. And also, it's this process, I mean, that £80,000 a year, that's not a joke. Part of that is the one way for them to acquire the sites that have been taken over is to buy them. Mm. And they need to demonstrate that they can perform this work at their own sites. So yes. there's, a, there's money involved in that as well. Yes, yes, they have bought some sites, haven't they? You showed us. Yes, we've helped them buy sites. Other people have helped them buy sites. Other, and the, the, the state has helped them buy sites, but they have a list. Yes. yes. Uh, some people are, have already said they're dona they've donated or they're doing it now. Oh, bless you. <laughs> bless you. Good, good. Perhaps I should increase the amount of money we need. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon's got a question. You might want to put uh, your microphone on and just ask it. Brandon. Only because he's, he said, what do you know about the Muisca? And I don't know uh, whether right. I... Well, the, the Muisca are the people who um, uh, the El Dorado myth is associated with. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that wonderful golden raft that was discovered. Um, this is the story of the chieftain who plunges into the Lake Guatavita by Bogota, um, covered in gold. Um, and uh, as his inauguration. Uh, the Muisca have very elaborate um, highland culture, um, which uh, uses the landscape or did use the landscape in a way which is very connected to the Kogi idea of Gona Vindua. Uh, so there are points, um, lines across the landscape, which were actually places for making offerings which were feeding the landscape. You also have the same um, vertical economy. Um, and one of the th intriguing things about the Muisca and, uh, is that here we have a very good picture of how their economy functioned because the Spanish did occupy and uh, took over and paid a lot of attention to how the economy functioned. And they're perhaps the best and clearest example of if you want to understand how you can have a large scale economy over a huge area without currency and without a notion of prices. But what we would call trading, which is not what they called it, um, you have a completely different um, concept of economic management. Uh, I've, just written an article which I'm hoping will be published shortly on the Kogi concept of the word, the word is zigoneshi, which is um, reciprocal exchange in, in a symbiotic way that keeps the whole systems functioning. And that was what the economy was. Hmm. Yes. And there are there are Muisca mamas who do um, Skype with me from time to time, a very cumbersome process, believe me. <laughs> yes, yes. Alan, this has just been absolutely wonderful. We are at time now, and I'd, I'd really like to ask everyone to turn their microphones on so that we can thank Alan appropriately, along with possibly donating on the website.